India gained independence from the British on the 15th of August 1947 at midnight. It was a hard-fought struggle to reach this historic moment as a free and independent nation. The challenges before India were many. For nearly two centuries, the colonial power had sapped India of its resources and wealth, leaving behind a legacy of exploitation and impoverishment. What you see is that in the 1950s, a very large number of CSI laboratories are established. And they're not established arbitrarily. There is a, a planning process and there is an attempt to dovetail the priorities of the five-year plans with the science and technology plan. So in order to build a prosperous and strong nation, it was imperative for independent India to create a solid foundation of science and technology by establishing large-scale science and engineering educational institutions for human resources on the one hand and on the other advanced scientific research facilities in a cross-section of fields from agriculture to medical research, atomic energy, even space technology. So that pressing problems that plagued our nation from low agricultural and food production to health facilities, building of infrastructure for irrigation, sanitation, transport, electricity, defense could be built in India. Defense Research Organization, DRDO, then they started a mission mode for uh, meeting the requirement of our defense uh, equipment, defense requirement, and today we have one of the best defense system in the world, and uh, to a large extent we have become self-reliant in defense technology. So in this episode of Science for a Self-Reliant India, we look at the building of India's institutions from CSIR to the IITs and other temples of science between 1947 and the early 1970s. We also look into the scientific policy resolution of 1958 that shaped India's science programs for years to come. We also delve into the legacy of some of India's scientific doyans like Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar, J.C. Ghosh, Vikram Sarabhai and Satish Dhawan. So let's begin this fascinating journey. During British rule, India's indigenous knowledge systems were neglected and even suppressed. Nor did the British adequately invest in India's infrastructure, its economy or its educational and research infrastructure. They invested only the bare minimum for governing and controlling India. Even the most essential requirements to improve agricultural production so that India's large population could be fed was never a priority for the British. So when we achieved independence in 1947, our political and scientific community had to start from the very basics. And they turned to science and technology as an essential medium for bringing development and prosperity to India. The years leading up to India's independence saw the growth of indigenous institutions like the Indian Institute of Cultivation of Science in 1876, the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore in 1907, Banaras Hindu University in 1916 and the Vishwabharati University in Shanti Niketan in 1921. These institutions were instrumental in developing an ecosystem for scientific research and innovation in the pre- and post-independence era. They produced a new generation of academics, scientists and technologists, all filled with nationalistic fervour, who then worked to lay the foundations of science and technology post-1947 who in turn built large-scale infrastructure, national laboratories and technical educational institutions were built and then nurtured by them across the country. Such as the foundation and growth of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research or CSIR, which was guided by Dr. Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar. Together with Arkot Ramaswamy Mudalai, 
Dr. Shanti Swaroop drafted the constitution of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research and later became its founding director general. Dr. Bhatnagar is now known as the father of research laboratories in India. He and his talented team were responsible for the establishment of a total of 12 national laboratories, which included National Chemical Laboratory Pune, the National Physical Laboratory New Delhi, the Fuel Research Institute Dhanbad, the Glass and Ceramic Research Institute, Central Food Processing Technology Institute in Mysore, the National Metallurgical Laboratory Jamshedpur and numerous other prominent laboratories under the aegis of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. That there were two very important agendas that institutionally shaped the trajectory of science in independent India, especially during the decade you might call the decade of decolonization, the 1950s. There was the industrial research agenda, imperative, uh, and that was in a way led by the figure of Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar, who was the director general of the CSIR. And then what you see is that in the 1950s, a very large number of CSIR laboratories are established. And they're not established arbitrarily. There is a, a planning process and there is an attempt to dovetail the priorities of the five-year plans with the science and technology plan. So the institutes are also established in a certain sequence, the CSIR institutions. Since independence, CSIR has played a pivotal role in partnering and strengthening Indian industry in the fields of aerospace, agrochemicals, petroleum and petrochemicals, chemical intermediates, polymers, glass and ceramics, mining, minerals and metals, coal, building materials, surface engineering, food processing, aromatic plants and healthcare products. India's first major science policy was formulated in 1958 by the government and a roadmap was created for expanding scientific enterprise and scientific temper in India. SPR 1958 recognized that science and technology were crucial for nation building and national prosperity. It would also help bridge the technological and economic divide between India and the developed countries. SPR 1958 recommended the cultivation of scientific enterprise in pure and applied science research and capacity building at a large scale. The post-SPR 1958 period saw large-scale investments in science which then resulted in the emergence of several scientific organizations, national laboratories and educational programs. SPR 1958 was therefore instrumental in laying a strong foundation for research and development and higher education in the country. You know, uh, when India got freedom, there were many problems. India did not have the sufficient food production, industrialization was very low and massive uh, uh, exodus of people from uh, the partitions. So there were lots of poverty, I mean so poverty was there, disease was there, reconstruction was needed. So in this era we require uh, development and in this development we require the technology. So technology that we were importing that were costing huge money. It was not the money of the technology that was needed. We also required the manpower, trained manpower who could manage the technology or who needed for industrialization of country. So the first requirement for the country was to develop the infrastructure for scientific uh, science and technology, research and development. So the first uh, scientific regulation that was passed in 1958 by the parliament, it was a commitment of the India government in the uh, potential of the science and technology, to use the science and technology for the development of the country. So it allocated a huge amount of money for building the institution, building the research institution. And you see in next one decade or two decades, a large number of scientific institutions were built. In the early 1940s, it was already felt that nuclear energy would play a critical role in electric power generation. In 1944, Homi Jahangir Bhabha 
proposed setting up of an institute for fundamental research. This opened up the door for India towards exploring the commercial application of atomic energy. India's first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru along with Bhava felt that atomic energy represented a new source of power that would revolutionize the very concept of energy in the future. It shows the absolute necessity of finding some new source of energy if the light of our civilization is not to be extinguished. I venture to predict that a method will be found for liberating fusion energy in a controlled manner within the next two decades. When that happens, the energy problems of the world will truly have been solved forever. The Atomic Energy Commission was set up in August 1948 and a few months later, the Department of Scientific Research was set up. This was followed by the setting up of the Department of Atomic Energy in 1954. In 1957, a talent search and scholarship program was started to find talented young students to train for work in the nuclear power field. The DAE was placed directly under the Prime Minister's office. It worked tirelessly to develop the first operational research reactor in 1956, which was followed by construction of India's first commercial reactor, Tarapur Atomic Power Station in Tarapur, Maharashtra in 1969. To get a perspective on how impoverished we were kept as a nation by the British when it came to higher educational institutions, we need only to see the small intake of students for first degree courses in engineering and technology across India. Mind you, India had a population of 35 crores in 1947. So 38 institutions in 1947 admitted only 3,000 students across the country. The number of postgraduates in engineering was even much smaller. Only 30 students were admitted across India in 1947. So it was imperative for India to establish technological institutions to train engineers and scientists on a large scale across many new fields to meet India's requirements for rapid economic and industrial development. And with this objective, the IITs were established in the 1950s. The Indian Institute of Technology was conceived by a 22-member committee of scholars and entrepreneurs in 1946 with the aim of promoting technical education in the country and hence producing trained manpower which could fuel India's trajectory of growth and progress. The NR Sarkar committee broadly made the following recommendations. Establishment of four higher technical institutions in the eastern, western, northern and southern regions of India. Establishment of the ones in the east and the west to be started immediately. The committee also felt that such institutes would not only produce undergraduates but should be engaged in research, producing research workers and technical teachers as well. The standard of the graduates should be at par with those from first-class institutions abroad. They felt that the proportion of undergraduates and postgraduate students should be two is to one. So then it was decided to establish IIT Bombay. Um, and uh, the Indians knew what they wanted. They didn't want a Russian-style institution. They wanted an MIT model. And they worked with the Russians to do so. And once that institution was well in place, the Americans came and had a review and said, wow, they've actually done it. And so the Americans then created a consortium of, I think, 10 American universities to help India build the IITs. All right. And this consortium helped in the creation of IIT Kanpur. So that was the American involvement in IIT Kanpur. We'd had Russian support in setting up IIT Bombay, we'd had American support in setting up IIT uh, Kanpur. And so the Germans came in and helped with the establishment of IIT Madras, the English came in, but to a more limited extent with the establishment of uh, IIT Delhi. And the goal of these institutions was to produce a technological cadre that would then 
uh, you know, enter into India's public sector industry and participate in this grander project of technological and of uh, larger technological project and also of nation building. On the recommendation of the NR Sarkar committee, the first institute in the country came up in 1950-51. At that time, it was called the Eastern Higher Technical Institute. And its first director was Sir J.C. Ghosh, who was a renowned chemist and is best known for his contribution towards scientific and industrial development and technology education in India. The present name, Indian Institute of Technology, was adopted before the formal inauguration of the institute on August 18, 1951, by India's first Minister for Education, Mulana Abul Kalam Azad. IIT Kharagpur started its journey with the first batch of 224 students and 42 teachers in August 1951. On September 15, 1956, the Parliament of India passed an act known as the Indian Institute of Technology Kharagpur Act, declaring this institute as an institute of national importance. The institute was also given the status of an autonomous university. IIT Kharagpur was followed by IIT Bombay in 1958, IIT Madras and IIT Kanpur in 1959 and IIT Delhi in 1961. Today, there are 23 IITs in the country that have consistently performed as institutions of excellence and produce some 16,000 engineers each year. Over the years, IITs have created world-class educational platforms which have driven and strengthened the innovation ecosystem in our country. On 15th August 1947, India's first Minister of Agriculture, Dr. Rajendra Prashad, who would go on to become India's first president in 1950, stated that India's most pressing task would be to conquer hunger. India at that time did not produce enough to feed its large population. So our planners turned to science and technology for solutions to pressing problems in sectors like health, agriculture, food supply, industrial research and energy, just to name a few. Eradication of diseases and creating health infrastructure was another priority of the government. With the result, new institutions and hospitals were established across the country. Many disease eradication programs were launched in the 1950s, such as the National Malaria Eradication Program in 1953. It was the biggest health program against a single disease. As a result of this, the number of deaths due to malaria began to decline. Similarly, the National Leprosy Control Program was launched in 1955. The National Filarial Control Program in 1955. The National Goiter Control Program in 1962. And the National Tuberculosis Control Program was again launched in 1962. Large health institutions were founded, like the All India Institute of Medical Sciences or AIMS, which was set up in New Delhi in 1956. New medical colleges were founded across India, boosting medical services, education and research. The Indian Public Health Association was formed for the first time in 1956. Its main objective was the promotion and advancement of public health and allied sciences in their different branches in India, protection and promotion of public and personal health of the people of the country and promotion of cooperation and fellowship amongst the members of the association. At the time of independence, India was plagued by malnutrition and hunger. Fighting hunger and poverty was then the topmost priority of the government of independent India. Agriculture was thought to address these twin challenges since more than 80% of the population at that time was either directly or indirectly dependent on agricultural activities. So the focal point of many policies and programs of the government of India was towards this direction. The mission was to bring more land under cultivation and improve the yield per hectare through intensive application of irrigation, improved seeds, fertilizers, research and development, etc. In 1958, for the first time in India, 
wheat production increased from 120 lakh tons to 170 lakh tons. American scientist Dr. William Gout called it the Green Revolution. During the mid-60s, Indian agricultural scientists developed a number of new high-yielding varieties of wheat seeds and rice varieties, giving rise in productivity of different crops. In 1964-65, an important program was launched, named Intensive Agricultural Area Program. Under this, the total production of food grains increased from 55 million tons in 1949-50 to 89 million tons in 1964-65. At the time of independence, our country was struggling to meet the basic requirements of food, fuel and medicines. But with proper application of scientific knowledge, we slowly became self-sufficient in the production of food, milk, fruits and vegetables, drugs and vaccines. We have to also require the technology for development and technology were not readily available. I mean the country which were given technology, they were giving the outdated technology or they were very costly. Foreign exchange were also not available at that time. So we had to develop some kind of indigenous technology. Giving one example of like uh, we were importing the baby food, butter, milk, etc. we were importing at that time. Baby food it was not available. And there was a thinking that uh, buffalo milk cannot be converted into uh, a powder and uh, we required the cow milk only. So, but then our Indian scientists, particular scientists, they decided to uh, develop a powder technology from the buffalo milk and they developed this thing and India became uh, self-reliant in this technology. These were the result of investments made in science and technology soon after independence. Investments in scientific research was just 0.1% in gross national product in 1947. It went up to 0.5% in less than a decade. In this episode of Science for a Self-Reliant India, we took a close look at the seminal role of science and technology in India's formative years after independence in virtually every sphere of socio-economic development of the country. The period from 1947 to the 1960s was significant for laying the foundation for augmenting human resources in science and technology by the establishment of technical institutions like the IITs. Correspondingly, it was a time to build virtually from scratch large-scale research institutions, laboratories and other infrastructure in areas as diverse as pharmaceuticals, agriculture, food processing, defense, space, atomic energy and many others. In our subsequent episodes in the special series of the freedom struggle and the scientific community, we take a closer look at the green revolution that transformed food supplies in India and the beginning of our space programs and India's leadership in the digital age. This and lots more only on India Science. So keep watching.